Okay, so my name is Lisa Tyson. I'm really excited to have everybody here today. I just want to go over a few of the kind of ground rules, if you will, and what we're planning to discuss today. And then Enrique, I see that you've joined us, so I'll turn it over to you um, to see if you have any other comments that you want to share before we get into the discussion. So um, we are scheduled to talk about how to land a great HR career. So we have um, two great mentors with us today, uh, Tally Schwager and Gabby Van Alstein. For those of you joining, I have everybody on mute right now just to cut down on the background noise. Um, we'll use the chat for questions and um, we'll, we'll see how big the group gets, but maybe we can even do a little bit of, um, you know, asking your own questions and stuff as we go along. The other special edition that we have for today's session, we're extending it by another half hour because we have part two of personal branding. So one of the mentors that was scheduled to talk last week had a conflict and they were really passionate about spending some time with you guys and made adjustments in their schedule so they could join today. So um, realize that that's a little bit of an adjustment to the schedule, but if any of you can stay on, we'd love to have you um, continue, like I said, personal branding part two. So um, with that, we, we want to make sure um, just so we can start to you know, continue to build on this community would really like to have everybody available to do audio if we turn over to that, but want to make sure we have everybody on video so, so we can see all of our, all of our faces and um, this community that we have for Cultivate. So before we jump into the discussion, let me just turn it over to Enrique. Um, if there's anything else you want to add or anything you wanted to include. Nope, just uh, welcome everybody and thank you to our uh, mentors of the session today. Tali, Gabby, it's uh, you know, great to see you. And Lisa, thank you so much for, you know, for uh, organizing the calls that we're going to have, uh, that we're having weekly for the Cultivate program. Just, just wanted to say a couple of things, uh, one of them related to the program and another one related to what's going on in the world. The one related to the program is, you know, as we said at the beginning of the program, the most advantage uh, that you could take out of this program depends on you. You know, we are, organ we're bringing people together. And we are providing, when we, when we define what we are, we just say, you know, we are uh, bridge builders. Because basically what we do is we build the connection between you and other folks. Now it is up to you whether you want to cross the bridge or not. And um, so whether you want to get engaged with your small teams in the Cultivate program, how much you want to get engaged with them, how many calls you want to have, how many calls you want to have with your mentors, that is absolutely up to you. Um, we, we, we are trying to just build those bridges so that you know, we provide as many avenues as possible for you to be connected with others. Um, so I'm hoping that you, take a, that you take the most advantage out of, that, out of those bridges and cross as many of them as possible during this program. Second thing that I want to say is, well, you know, we're all, uh, I think, uh, like, um, like somebody said to me last week, this is the first time in history that the entire world or humanity is going through the same thing at the same time. And no, no, not even one time before, and not even during the world wars and, and other time in history, we have gone through the same thing, all of us together at the same time. And it is hard, right? I mean, the coronavirus, it is hard. It is taking a toll on a number of cities. We live here. I, I live in California. California is the second epicenter of, uh, of the coronavirus in the U.S. besides New York City. And, you know, some other countries are going through a lot of hardship. And, you know, people can't see themselves in person anymore. You know, you, you want to hug somebody else and you can't. You know, you want to shake hands and you can't. You know, you want to, you know, just like hang out with somebody in a party or happy hour or running or biking, whatever it is, and you can't. So the, the best next thing that we have <laughs> available is these kinds of connections, right? There are many, many people right now building these platforms for people to connect, to get together and, you know, just, just see each other talk and vent about what's going on, ask for help, offer help. So take advantage of all these avenues that people are building for you to remain socially connected, right? Because social distancing doesn't mean social isolation. And then the, the last thing that I want to say is that for the topic of the day, of course, you know, how to land a great um, HR career, you know, we're all going through this, um, you know, major changes Many companies are shutting down and things are happening. It's going to become more and more complicated. But I think all of us remain really hopeful about a better future after, after we get out of this crisis. And, uh, um, you know, we hope 
that you continue building your your capabilities, that you continue networking, that you continue learning, and uh, you know, uh, so that either now or in the future, whenever we are out of this mess, you know, you are in a great place to offer a great amount of value to whatever organization you want to work for. So. That's basically what I want to say, I'm, I, and I apologize in advance. I'm going to have to jump out. Tali, Gabby, apologize me, please, and everybody else. I have to jump out um, like about 20 minutes before the end of the, before, uh, well, 10 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, I'm going to be doing a LinkedIn live session about something else, but I'll be here in the meantime as well. So thank you, everybody. It's great to see you. Tali, Gabby, Lisa, thank you, and thank you, everybody else. Thank you. Thank great. you. Thank you, Enrique. Okay. So let's um, go ahead and jump in. Um, if you do have a question, feel free to ask it in the chat. Um, I will be monitoring that as we go through and, and we'll have um, time at the end of the session for some Q&A. Um, so hopefully we get your, your uh, answers question, your questions answered, um, but really want this to be an interactive session too, okay? So let's start off. Um, I'd like to have our two mentors just give a little bit of background. Um, we're going to ask you some more specific questions about points in your career and some tips that you might have, but um, Tally, if you could just start off talking to us a little bit about um, your HR career or your career, because the other thing I think that's important to get out of the session is that not everybody knew they wanted to be in HR from the beginning and not everybody um, has been in HR their entire career. So it's, it's certainly possible to transition um, into different fields and different functions. So Tally, if you can take it away and share with us um, a little bit more about yourself and your career in particular. Absolutely. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. It's nice to see your faces. Uh, my name is Tali, as Lisa introduced me. Um, in terms of my career, so I thought I was going to law school. I was headstrong on that. And, you know, I was preparing for my LSATs and everything when I was an undergrad. And I happened to have networked with someone and I ended up volunteering at this conference about talent development and how to get um, people who are underrepresented to, pit, to positions of you know, leadership in companies. And I was so enthralled by the research that was spoken about, the research that was delivered during this conference that I started networking with the folks around me. And it was heads of HR from some of the most prominent companies, Bloomberg, Goldman Sachs, you name it, uh, the heads of HR were in that round table. And it turned out that I had a connection to the head of HR at Bloomberg and was lucky enough to land an internship in the professional development department within Bloomberg. And that was my first kind of step in the door in HR. And from there, everything flourished. So that was in London and I fell in love with London. And I found a program that actually allowed me to work and study in London for one year after I graduated. And in that program, I was a recruiting coordinator and program manager for the um, graduate programs that they have. You know, after you graduate, there's like a two year rotational program. So I was managing that for the investment bank. And I had a great mentor who helped me through everything. Uh, she helped me land my job when I returned back to the US a year later. I worked at Citibank for a bit doing technology recruiting um, and program management. And then thereafter, I said, I want to join a startup. I want to be in tech. And so I, I landed a great position uh, as the head of talent acquisition for a very rapidly growing company called Flashpoint. About two and a half years later, I uh, was able to land a career as the head of HR for Coindesk, which is a cryptocurrency and digital asset news publication. So that's where I am right now, totally pivoted from, you know, studying the law and reading all the statutes that I wouldn't understand with all the legalese involved. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's how I got to where I am today. And I'm happy to go into detail um, further in the conversation. Okay, great. Thank you. I thought when you started out um, with your interest in being a lawyer, you're going to say that you switched to like employee relations or you, you decided to not go headstrong into to being a lawyer, but that, that's a great path and sounds like a, some good experience you've got. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Gabby, let's hear from you. Yeah, so um, so hi, everyone. So happy to be here. Um, uh, definitely, uh, you know, um, love human resources and I'm always happy to share. Um, I believe it is a calling 
in it as well as a profession. And so I'm so excited to connect with you all today. Um, so originally from Pittsburgh and actually in college, I studied um, literature and, uh, and just knew I wanted to, um, I knew I wanted to teach in some way or always be connected to development as far as strength finders developer is um, my number uh, two strength after blue, which stands for winning others over. And so um, I had this profile um, that would fit to be a teacher, I think, but um, you know, moved after college to um, the great state of Indiana, kind of here in Indianapolis, and um, and started searching. And I saw a role for an HR coordinator, and um, just was really excited about some of the responsibilities of the role. So I took that, started my HR career. And probably within about six months, I was able to develop some trainings and things like that for a staffing company. I worked for the corporate side. Um, I said, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to build my career, probably after about six months in it. So I was employee number 64 at this company, and we operated in three states. And by the time I left, about five years later, I was one of 275 employees. We were in 17 states. And so really got to see some explosive growth and help navigate the company through that. Hire people completely over the phone because I won't give you um, a spoiler on my age, but that was before like video calls were a thing. And so, um, so that was a great opportunity. And from there, I, you know, I just wanted to change, wanted to um, first myself more in employee relations. So I ended up taking a role as um, assistant director at a very large um, convenience store. Uh, retail operations chain and so we had about 700 employees um, in the field and so that was really interesting really fun and basically was number two in HR for that um, and you know started to build my uh, strategic HR muscles um, from there um, you know I moved to um, a, a tech firm in Indianapolis so that you know I could finally be a director wanted to, to run my own ship and and really um, started building my uh, strengths and competencies and leadership development and professional development programs and then um, the tech environment and sector is just completely different fell in love with it with a high growth organization um, and so worked there for a bit had a great experience and then I said you know I really want to lead a team and so um, ended up working as HR director at a uh, branch of Indiana University. And so um, got uh, to really work in a large matrix organization as we were switching over to HR shared services model. And um, so we had about 500 employees and working with tenured faculty as well as staff and contracts and um, just a really great environment got to be part of the strategic movement to um, change our HR services model across the organization. Decided from there, hey, you know what? I'll take this weird pivot and teach for two years. So I taught HR in college for two years and career development courses. Super excited. And now I'm back working in HR full time at an employee engagement firm. So I'm director of people operations there. We have some pretty aggressive growth plans and we partner with organizations on um, really driving engagement. So I'd say my areas of interest are probably uh, talent development and um, engagement. And I have a lot of experience uh, in employee relations just from the experience I had, but so excited to dig into the career stuff with you today. Okay, great, thanks. So you switched out of full-time teaching just in time before everything went totally remote, right? <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. And we, um, one of the premises on which I was hired was, you know, we want to build a remote first culture because we're in this software as a service industry that this is an easy, this is, it's not actually easy for anyone, but it's pretty easy for us. There was no question. We've been working fully remote for about three and a half weeks now. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, this is certainly um, headfirst into the diving board. Is, and so now I'm creating totally remote onboarding, um, totally remote professional development resources and things like that. So you know, right before all this happened. So. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. So um, let's start into our questions here. I'm going to throw out a question and love to hear from both of you. So um, the first one is, what do you think was your best career move? And what was your riskiest? So maybe they were one and the same, but how would you, um, what, what are your thoughts on the, those two areas? Your best career move and your riskiest. So Dahlia, I see you shaking your head. Why don't sure. you jump in? 
<laughs> yeah, so happy to jump in. Uh, my best career move was transitioning from a large organization. I was at Citibank. I was doing tech recruiting, and I really wanted to be a big fish in a small pond, mm -hmm. uh, to be frank. And I love technology, so I moved into a cybersecurity startup, and it was such a challenge. I had to embrace all the moving parts of a fast growing organization. So learning the industry, learning the company, but also learning my role. I was, a, you know, the single HR person there, like there was nobody else. And so taking that on um, was a huge feat. And I, the learnings are so invaluable from that experience. I was able to manage all of talent acquisition, um, just like Gabby grew um, her firm previously. I uh, grew, I was number 53. I grew the company to 185 before we even had a team. Um, so it was an incredible experience. I learned so much from it. Um, and I guess, you know, transitioning from there to the, to the riskiest career move um, was to, to join Coindesk because I'm the head of HR. So it's the whole enchilada. It's something I've never done before. Um, I, you know, I had my hands in a bunch of different areas within HR, um, having been at a startup, having been the only HR person at the startup, but um, I've never written, you know, compliant ready policies. I've never engaged in employee relations issues that, you know, I had to lead into investigations, mm -hmm. um, you know, things like that, that I just never faced before. So this was really throwing myself into the deep end and trying to figure out, okay, well, how do I tackle this? Because mm -hmm. it's sink or swim and I wanted to, to swim. Um, and so that's, that's, um, that's the riskiest and, um, and, and the best move for me. Okay, great. Gabby, what about you? What was the, the best career move? Yeah, the, um, oh, that's, well, to be continued, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, I think that's great. I think, uh, you know, the best career move was probably transitioning into um, Rickers, which was the large, the convenience store retail operation organization, um, just because I ended up having, I took the role for the VP of HR because of the mentorship that I would receive. And she really, really, we're still in contact to this day and she's helped me to, to, to develop into, you know, a really well-rounded HR professional. And so, you know, that might be a, a bit of advice. It's okay, especially as you're starting out, to take a job um, because of the development opportunities offered to you by your supervisor, um, you know, by the leader. And it doesn't have to be necessarily someone in HR, because Tally probably knows, but in smaller companies or tech companies, sometimes people opt, you know, reports up through finance or a different area or the CEO or something like that. But um, if you feel like, hey, I can really grow from working with this person, and, um, you know, just absolutely uh, don't know where I'd be in HR without her. So that's probably the best move. And then I'd say a risky move was actually transitioning from working in HR to teaching HR. Just because I was worried about, you know, I knew I wouldn't want to do that forever. I was worried about transitioning back um, and what that would look like as far as my trajectory. But um, a lesson that I always share with people in uh, Lena and Cheryl Sandberg says, try not to view your career so much as a ladder. Think of it more as a jungle gym, right? And so make interesting pivots that will help you build your skills, you know, build, um, you know, areas in which you are interested in, feed your heart with joy, right? But then also, you know, just remember that as long as you're doing that, you're always going to have a great narrative when you're ready to transition back. And if you're talented, you should have no problem. Okay, great. Thank you. Good insights. So um, the Cultivate program, as you know, is looking to provide HR development to students who are um, in an HR program or just recently coming out of it and who are starting to gain some HR experience. So how would you advise people who are looking to kind of get their first real job in HR um, that have maybe little HR experience right now? Any advice as you guys think back about your career and then some of the people that you hire and work with now? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so uh, I can start, but Tally, then you can. Um, so uh, definitely, you know, as a as an HR professor, um, you know, and I was a leader of the HR Student Association at Indiana University Kokomo. So um, you know, looking at um, 
programs like that where you can get involved in and student organizations that will help build these skills, I think um, super helpful. You can become a student member of SHRM. I think it is uh, $40, I believe, a semester, but schools may be able to support you in that as well. So I think um, just, you know, teaching yourself, like, remember, no one knows everything and Tally probably relates for right now there's all this changing legislation regarding um, you know what's happening right now in the environment we're all just trying to learn and keep up so you know there's never going to be a time where you're like I know everything I'm ready now to venture into HR what you need to do is shift your mindset to like I'm you know I'm teaching myself as much as I can and then I'm going to learn so I'd say go to the SHRM website very frequently understand the different functional areas of HR like that we mentioned on the call talent development, recruiting and staffing, employment law, employee relations, benefits and compensation, understand the different areas and the different like pillars of HR, and you know, maybe even identify an interest. I think that would be, um, you know, or a couple areas where you're like, I'm pretty interested in, and I think that would be great. And then two, I'm a huge proponent of networking. And now is a really weird time, you can't do it in person, but I know like I'm certain Tally's on the call, I'm on the call, there are so many people out there that love HR. We'll meet with you via Zoom. I just posted on LinkedIn, like I'm happy to do that, you know what I mean, and share with you my experiences, share with you more resources, and maybe even help you forge your path in HR. So reach out to someone in HR on LinkedIn, make sure to send them a personalized invite, and explain to them, hey, I think you have a cool job, I wanna learn more about HR, can we meet sometime for 20 minutes virtually, right? And you can share with me about your career and you will learn so much by doing that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, great idea to do that virtual coffee right now, right? <laughs> um, Taylor, what are your thoughts about um, getting HR experience when you're just starting out? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that you guys are, are actually doing it um, right now. You know, you're involved in hacking HR, you're involved in in Cultivate, I think that is, you know, giving you a step up at, uh, amongst the rest um, who want to get into HR. So, you, you know, you're definitely doing it right now. A lot of you have concentrations within um, your studies on HR or are solely focused on HR. So, you know, that's great. Those are going to give you the knowledge and the concepts of the different HR facets that you'd like to get into. Um, but to echo Gabby's point, you know, network, talk to your career advisors and your career centers. They're going to be able to help you with resume building. They're going to be help. They're going to be able to help you with opportunities that they know are available. Go to your career fairs, um, network in student groups that you're a part of. And I would say take whatever experience you have in, in your studies, whether that's being um, in charge of recruitment for Greek life, I know that was, you know, a big thing when I went to school um, and taking whatever experience you have and, and transferring them and and being able to articulate what that experience looks like on paper and how that transfers into the field of HR. So whether it's, you know, HR requires massive organizational skills, which I'm probably lacking, um, but um, you can demonstrate that by showing, you know, your ability to coordinate um, across multiple groups of people and, and deal with, you know, juggling, moving parts, et cetera. So just being able to take your experiences and articulating those in terms of the HR language and the business language, I think will really, really help you. Um, so, you know, in addition to what Gabby said, those are, those are my two cents. Okay, great. Can you guys give um, a little bit of advice? Um, both of you talked a little bit about um, different industries that you've worked in, um, working in bigger companies versus smaller companies. When you have you know, different opportunities or when you're targeting um, different companies to work to try to get some experience in, um, what thoughts or insights would you give the, the group here about um, going for you know, the, the big fish in a small pond or the, the small fish in a big pond? So, um, Gabby, maybe we'll jump over to you. What, what thoughts do you have? Sure, sure. Um, well, I think that's great, too. And, um, yeah, it's, it's very important to understand when you're – so, as far as experience in HR, I feel like um, it's still pretty agnostic. So, you know, you can jump, like, 
you know, if you're working in retail as an HR director for the corporate center, uh, you know, of a retail operation, I feel like you still have great opportunities to jump over and to tech or to manufacturing as an HR professional. It's agnostic in the way that benefits you, but it certainly is helpful for you to understand what you enjoy, um, you know, and the kind of environment that you will thrive in as an HR professional. And so um, I think it's really important to read. Um, I would talk to my students a lot about this. Like, you're either more driven from an industry standpoint or a functional standpoint. And so um, I've been always driven as an HR, like, functional gal. You know, and my secondary is industry. And so I've worked in higher ed, I've worked in retail, I've worked in tech. Now, that being said, after experiencing all of those, I do enjoy a small environment where I can feel my impact, I can feel my influence. And honestly, it's a little bit um, more free in terms of what you can do and um, less bureaucracy. And so, you know, um, I think experience is great. Like, um, you know, when you get there, when you're ready to have internships, I advise my students to have at least two internships. One, like places are always looking for free interns. So if you can do one where you're paid and you do one that you get credit for, but then do another one and you won't have to work as many hours, but just offer to basically help and learn more about the industry that way, I think that's great. I think understanding that industries that have been around longer and larger organizations like banking, like big box retailers, like higher education, those are going to be maybe slower moving, maybe a little bit more bureaucratic, maybe more policies, but also safer. I think understanding tech, um, it's going to be more fun, more challenging, more rapid pace, but you'll be able to see your impact more. So I think you need to think about industry size, how long the industry has been around, as well as like company size. The, like Tally mentioned, I'm also, you know, the only HR person in a small shop. So I have to do everything. I love that because it gives me a lot of change and challenge. If you know that you don't like that and you know, I love recruiting, I just want to stay in recruiting, maybe a large organization is better for you. So read about it, again, the networking, um, and just experience as much as you can. I think those would be great things. Okay, great. Tilly, your thoughts? Yeah, so again, echoing everything that Gabby said, um, I would say try to get experience in in both worlds, you know, the big big corporate worlds, but also, you know, the, the smaller um, companies as well, just so that you can feel for what motivates you and you know what environment you would thrive in um you would get that more structured um environment in a bigger company and maybe that's a good point to start your career because you know you'll have that guidance you'll have that mentorship you know your your job will hopefully be very you know straightforward and you know you'll know what to tackle every day whereas you know maybe later in your career you want to think about uh, how to expand, you know, your impact and, and, you know, effectively make your impact. And so that's when perhaps you might want to consider a, a smaller company where you can really, you know, drive the function, drive the strategy um, and, and see your impact, you know, almost immediately, which is so, so rewarding. Uh, I do think industry is important. I think for me, what motivates me is, is, interest in the industry like if i don't believe in in what the goal of the company is i don't know that i would be able to personally thrive in it um so it's really important for me to to feel aligned with the values as well as the mission and vision of the company i join and so just having that curiosity um and having just the thoughtfulness of okay why why this company is to me equally as important as as the role that i would be playing in it yeah. great very good advice what about um your thoughts on i mean obviously people are going through hr programs and, and different degree programs right now what are your thoughts about additional hr certifications um, do you think that that's something that's needed um, does that make you stand apart make you more competitive um, what are your thoughts gabby i see you're shaking your head first so we'll, we'll jump to you <laughs> yeah so you know that's great i think um so i am not certified i think it's wonderful to be certified if your organization pays for it um you know and that's kind of how i've always felt i'll share 
you just, this is anecdotal, but I feel like um, tech industry and more modern industries kind of care about it less. And then larger organizations like will prioritize it more when hiring. So I think, you know, it probably would instill a little bit of confidence, right? And like extra credentials are never bad. I can share with you um, when I've recruited, um, it's definitely been, you know, for someone to serve on my team with me, it's been a consideration. It's never a deal breaker, but I mean, that may be an unpopular opinion. I do think it is, um, I think it's worthwhile to consider it. I think, um, you know, maybe even negotiating um, on your first role and saying, you know, I'd like for you to pay for the test and this prep program. I, I would recommend that as the day is long. Um, if you can join any kind of student association where you'll be, you know, a SHRM student chapter member, I think that is super wonderful. I think it's good to know and understand and be aware of the test and the test options. So HRCI or SHRM. Um, those are, those are probably the most complete thoughts I have on it. Hallie, what about you? Yeah, um, no, I, I actually agree. I'm not certified. I did sign up to uh, take the uh, SHRM test this now August. Um, so I, I will hopefully pass and be certified, but I don't think it's a deal breaker whatsoever. I think what's more important is the substance, you know, what are you gaining from it? What, you know, it's nice to have something written on paper, but ultimately what is the point and what are you going to take away from it? And that's all that matters because that's what you're going to apply to your careers. And that's what you're going to apply on your day to day when you carry out your deliverables. So yeah, I, I agree. I don't think it's a deal breaker. It's bigger companies, like Abby said, probably consider it more. Um, but you know, it is a nice to have, uh, but ultimately it's the takeaways and the learnings that you would get from any kind of certification that are most important. Okay, great. Um, another, just a, a um, an add on here too is when you think about the different services with Shroom and some other organizations, you can still participate in them without being certified. So um, the, the certification piece shouldn't scare you away. And, and really to find out, you know, what makes sense for you is, is the best part. Mm -hmm. um, going into the specialist. So as you think about the different areas of HR, um, so really putting you guys on the spot here. So when you think about the traditional areas of HR, how would you advise somebody on whether or not they should specialize? And then how do they factor in the future of work as it relates to HR? Yeah, um, I'm happy to start. So what I think I would do, um, honestly, I think it's so hard to know when you're first starting out if you should specialize because that's quite a commitment. So I would and, and jobs are more, you know, present um, and abundant in being a generalist. And I think it gives you the most flexibility. So I would almost advise um, unless you know for certain, like my heart is in benefits and compensation, unless you know that for sure, I would advise trying to start out as a generalist. Um, and there are a lot of like, there are a lot of roles that you can get that will give you great transferable skills, even if your first role isn't technically human resources, and then build your career, you know, start to build your career as a generalist, and then you'll have great opportunities to specialize. And so, like I said, you know, I started out as a coordinator, assistant director, and then director, um, but, you know, I feel very confident now, you know, and I've, I've, um, chatted with some companies and considered some offers to specialize in talent development and leadership development. Those opportunities I had through be like to sharpen my skill set to being a generalist. And so, you know, in my opinion, unless you get offered a great job as a specialist or you know for certain, I think it's a good idea to start off as a generalist, a coordinator if you can, um, even, you know, a really relevant um, and common career path is to start off as a staffing specialist in a staffing company that hires individuals. So start off there, work your way into a generalist role in HR, learn about the full scope of functions and disciplines within HR, and then you can kind of choose which area you want to specialize in. And just when you're working in HR, you get access to people that have experience in that area, and you can keep learning and growing. It's like, I'm a generalist now, but I know eventually I'll be, 
you know, an orgav consultant or something like that. That would be my advice. Okay. Yeah. Great. Taylor? Yeah. Um, again, completely <laughs> agree with Gabby. Um, so thank you for, for uh, leading the way there. Um, yeah, I agree. Like, I, I think also it's hard to, to land a specialist role when you're just um, emerging in, in, in your career. So um, it's always great to start out as a generalist or as a coordinator. I started out doing recruiting coordination, you know, printing out name badges, you know, it's not all glorified. And then from there, I learned about uh, program management and what it's like to develop graduate programs and provide training opportunities. So it's a combination, you know, get in the door, um, learn what's available to you, uh, because sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Uh, so it's important to just do your research, learn, see, see what motivates you, what makes you say, I want to do that. Um, and, you know, that's going to help me feel fulfilled. And that's where you can develop your area of specialty if, you know, that's where the route you want to go down. Um, so I would, I would definitely do that. And I would leverage, you know, your, your mentors and your network to, to really learn as much as possible about you know, the different um, areas of HR and the competencies required for those roles and tie those competencies back to, okay, where are your skills? Where are you know, where are the things, what are the things that make you happy and to do the competencies in that job description uh, in that specialty area align to what I want to do and what, you know, makes me get up every morning. Um, I think another way of deciding whether you want to go the specialist route is to raise your hand um, for initiatives within companies. Like there's so many things going on that's within HR that might be outside of your day to day, um, you know, culture initiatives, diversity inclusion initiatives. So get involved in, in those um, types of projects because that will also give you hands-on experience into the different specialty areas. And that will give you an idea of whether that really suits you and in, in your interests. Okay, great. Yeah, I think one of my best bosses was somebody who used to volunteer me for things. <laughs> and so <laughs> getting getting some different exposure to different parts of HR and things I wouldn't have necessarily signed up for, but um, turned out to be some really great experience. So good advice. Um, I'd like to ask the mentors, um, as you think about um, your career and mentors that have had an impact on you, especially if they were in HR, what advice would you give the group? Um, so a couple things just to keep in mind. So we have these topics, you know, we're going to have a total of five. So we've got three more sessions coming up where we're going to have access to mentors like yourself. We also have um, a, a mentor who's assigned to the learning pods or to a group of students. So they're going to get, you know, quality time with that individual. How would you, how did you make the most or what kind of impact did a mentor have on you? And how would you recommend that the students make the most of who they have access to over the, the culture or throughout the Cultivate program? And before we jump into that, I'll go to you first, Gabby. But before we jump into that, I just want to remind everybody, um, if you have some questions, to definitely use the chat feature because we'll, we'll start to include those. Um, we are at, uh, we got about 20 minutes less of, of this particular session, but we'd love to hear your questions so that we can, you know, get insights specifically from uh, Tally and, and Gabby that would be um, specific to your questions. So with that being said, Gabby, we'll jump to you and get your thoughts about mentoring. Yeah, so um, definitely, I think it's super important um, at any point in your life to always have, um, you know, a professional mentor or sometimes I like to call it and I've heard it referred to before as a professional board of directors. And so um, this would be a group of individuals that are invested in your growth and development, but maybe each serve a different purpose. And so um, my supervisor and I shared that I did actually take a job because I was so interested in her mentorship and I have strongly considered other opportunities like on my recent switch I had um, a couple opportunities and I almost took one because of the mentorship I would receive so I think it's definitely a consideration when you're taking roles to think about the opportunity the informal development that you'll get from that mentorship um, component but getting the most out of a mentoring relationship would be um, one, make sure to set expectations for honesty, for transparency, for communication cadence. And so, you know, something that I try to do is still meet with my mentor, whether over, you know, talk at least once a month 
whether over the phone or it used to be in person, hopefully we'll get back there someday, um, that, you know, meet up once a month. And then for those meetings, certainly, you know, over the years, we've gotten to know each other really personally. So we have a lot of personal catching up to do, but I always have and can prepared with one to two questions for her of a professional nature. And so just understanding what you want and what you hope to get out of the relationship, because remember, this person is there to support you, but they shouldn't be leading the conversation about your development. And actually just in terms of career development as a whole, right? You know, you have to be the catalyst. You have to be the initiator. And so think about, you know, what can I benefit from? So I think that would be really important. And then I think asking that person to be frank with you and share those opportunities, like, you know, be honest with me, where do you see me struggling or, or what setbacks do you think, you know, I should prepare myself for, or what areas do you think I should, are opportunities where I need to develop as an HR professional. So I think that's really important. And then I could probably write a novel on like finding and selecting those mentors and personal board of directors, but I'm happy to like answer those later or, you know, um, communicate one-on-one -on -one with individuals. So. Great. Thank you. Tally. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this might not answer your question directly, but I do want to share a personal anecdote with all of you and uh, demonstrate the impact that my uh, mentor, my main mentor in life has had on me. She was my first manager when I was working in London. And when I was in college, I was so used to getting so frantic about tests, about you know, the anxiety of writing a paper or just sitting there and having 45 minutes to answer all these test questions and not get it done in time. And I was very, my, my grievances were very uh, obvious to the world. <laughs> so let's just put it that way. And I, you know, I kind of took that with me, not even realizing that that is the way that I behaved when I was under pressure or, or stressed out and I got away with it in college because ultimately it was your grade. You know, your teacher is not going to, your professor is not going to tell you, oh, you're, you're like too anxious, you know, stop it. Um, but um, I, you know, remember that I was, there was an event that was going on and not everything got delivered and I was very frantic about it. And um, my manager pulled me aside, you know, the next day and was like, I know that you get everything done and that you deliver. But other people don't know that. They don't have this relationship with you and they don't see that. So the perception versus reality of the situation is so critical to think about. And you need to present yourself in a way that others perceive you. And I know this kind of goes into the personal branding thing, so I'm not trying to step on anyone's toes there. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, the way that others perceive you as a professional is, is so, so critical. And I've taken that to this very day. She's told me, you can go back to your seat and put headphones on and, you know, be disappointed and grumpy, or you can go back to your seat and you can smile and be the tally I know, like, that you are. And I, you know, it was very hard to hear that advice, um, but it was probably the best advice I've ever received from my mentor uh, because that helped me land my entire career. That helped me keep poise under pressure. It helped me, you know, keep calm and carry on, et cetera. So, you know, that's just my personal anecdote um, about, you know, mentorship and the impact that it's had on my life. Um, in terms of, you know, other facets of mentorship, um, there could be mentors outside of HR that you can relate to um, that can give you advice. And that might be really helpful for you to, to get an outsider's perspective or someone in the business that could really help you hone your skills. Um, it depends whether it's someone that's helping you, you know, manage your day to day or manage your career long term. So, you know, choose your mentor wisely. Um, and like Abby said, ask for feedback. You know, feedback is so important feedback is going to help you improve and it's not easy to hear but it'll help you succeed so that would be my advice on mentorship okay that's great um a couple of points to just to echo um between what telly and gabby said and and so you guys know um Kelly and Gabby are meeting each other virtually right for the first time. So a lot of their information and, and their backgrounds and stuff and what they're sharing is in sync, but um, uh, definitely um, meeting each other and really um, connecting for the first time. I just wanted to call out a couple of things because sometimes people feel like they have one mentor for life, right? So, um, and, and a mentor has to be within HR. So I think, uh, you know, just reinforcing something you said, Kelly, about um, you know, finding a mentor could be, you know, outside of HR, could be another part of the business. 
And um, Gabby, I just wanted to reinforce some things that you said too about how important it is to have kind of you know goals and, and what do you want to get out of that relationship, right? Because um, that can help you decide who the mentor is. Um, it also can help you decide um, if you need to switch it up or if you need to look for somebody else. So, you know, one of the downsides, you know, sometimes with a formal mentoring program is you're matched together and it may not always be the best relationship for everybody. So, um, so think about, you know, what do you need to get out of the relationship? Be open to some of the feedback like Tally you received instead of, you know, just shutting down or getting disappointed with that. Um, but just being open to different people that you can interact with and connect with. So great points. Um, a couple other things I just wanted to, um, you, you both of you have kind of sprinkled some of these responses, I think, but if you could just summarize, what do you think or how would you advise people um, when it comes to looking at a particular job? Um, so what kind of career factors, if you will, should they take into consideration? Um, and how should they approach their decision making for the job? Because you know, you've got big company, small company, um, generalist or an opportunity to specialize. Um, you know, where does international experience you know, come into this? So there's a lot to be taken into consideration. And then you have all the variables that go along with your personal situations too, right? So from a career perspective, um, what would you kind of summarize or how would you try to um, help somebody hone in on what would be some good decision making for them for their career. So um, Gabby, let's start with you. <laughs> um, sure, sure, absolutely. Um, so I think that's a that's a wonderful question. I kind of like the buckets that you've distilled. So I think you you need to break it up almost into like um, professional as well as personal. And so personal, those are all you know. Those are things like salary. Those are things like do I have to relocate. Um, you know, those are things like preference. How do I feel, you know, about like working with this organization? I think those are just as important, right? Um, that it works for you on those levels as professional. And for professional, I definitely do think size of the organization um, matters. And you need to assess, you know, um, whether or not you're a person that needs to or really enjoys feeling and seeing your impact. Um, you know, quickly. And so, you know, I personally always enjoyed like creating, like researching, creating, proposing a new initiative, and then I enjoy like executing it and seeing the results. If you like doing that, you can really like see your impact and feel it. Now in a larger organization, you're one of, you know, maybe 20 working on this task force to do that. So I think it's important to consider size of organization and, and where you get out if that matters to you. Another thing that's totally so important is culture. So, um, you know, the organizational culture, you really need to understand. And there are, you can do a quick Google search, but there's great, great questions you should be asking during the interview to assess organizational culture. And things like, you know, these are not, do they have a ping pong table? Um, is there an open, or, you know, that's, that's nice. Those are nice little perks, right? Um, you know, can I wear jeans or not? But organizational culture is so much more, it's how are decisions made, okay? Um, how do they treat their people? How do they view like professional development? How do they view um, like tenure status and longevity in terms of a career? Like at Amplify, we like it when our people like, we hate to see them leave, but we like it when they graduate out of Amplify. Because we're a small company, we can't always make them VP or whatever. But when they get a VP role somewhere else, we're happy for them and it means they sharpen their skill sets with us. And so like understanding how that organization views that, understanding how important and they prize leadership. So is the person that's interviewing you that will be your supervisor, are they constantly growing as a leader or are they just good and people kind of let them do, you know what I mean? What, what's communication like? So culture is huge and you really need to have that culture from the beginning to the end of the interview process. I think it's so important. And then also, I think it's really important to think about your growth trajectory and what you're wanting and in terms of how likely you'll be able to get that because of the company, the industry. And so, um, for example, I was recently, I did this job search. So I was looking at a design firm, like so creative design services, 
a SaaS company, software as a service, right? And then the other one was an applicant tracking system. So I had offers in all three and I decided I really think, you know, which ATS is also SaaS, right? Applicant tracking system. So I said, I think I'll have the best career opportunity based on that versus creative consulting. So I looked at the industry in terms of that and then I also want to look at the company too and the reputation of the company. Are people wanting to work there? Is it an employer of choice? And I don't just mean lists because those lists, organizations can buy their way onto best places to work, best culture, stuff like that. Um, you know, but I mean like look at their social media, look at their presence on LinkedIn. Are people engaging in their posts? Are people following them? Do they have ambassadors of their organization that are their customers or that necessarily don't work there? Um, do a Google search on the org, go to Glassdoor and look at their approval rating, the CEO and the reviews of the firm. And then this is the biggest one. Do a Google search of the firm and click on the news tab. And don't work for an organization that has <laughs> scandals, right? Or has a lot of recent scandals. Um, and that's thing we forget. Side note, do that for candidates too once you're hiring. But regardless, that's my <laughs> those are a couple of my points. Okay, great. Yeah. Kelly. Yeah, um, definitely culture is important to assess, but it's difficult to assess culture um, because sometimes you're given the what you want to hear from an interviewer. So, um, you know, do your best to evaluate that culture, but what does culture really mean? Um, Gabby, I saw in your LinkedIn post um, the other day that you guys rolled out your values to everyone and everyone had a workshop and they and they each kind of I think it was an artistic depiction of the of the value and I thought that was so cool because it really got everyone to buy in so our company is doing things like that you know what are their values and how do they live their values so just like Abby said asking the right interview questions um, but also assessing can I contribute to this organization and will this organization give something back to me it has to be a mutual fit and Sometimes, you know, I, this is not data driven. This is just my two cents, but in your intuition will tell you like, is, is this a match? Like, am I going to thrive here? And sometimes, you know, and you know, it's kind of like a dating game. Like when it, when it works, you can totally feel it. And, you know, and there you go. Like you found your match. Um, but beyond that, just again, reading the job descriptions, they don't tell you everything. So whatever isn't clarified in a job description, ask the person that is interviewing you, ask the hiring manager, um, you know, be very clear about your expectations and clarify their expectations so that you know there's a match. I had a candidate the other day who was awesome, we got along really well, and you know, the fit was there, you know, if we played the dating game, it was there. Um, but you know, she was, I hate to say overqualified for the role, but she, you know, was looking for something where she can manage people and, um, you know, really own the function. And it wasn't the case with me because um, it, it was a different role that I was hiring for. And we had a very honest conversation like, you know, hey, I don't know if this is for you because you want to get here and the position that I have is, is more suitable for somebody with less experience. So just having an honest conversation, asking the right questions and just being truthful with yourself. Like, is this what I really want to do? And am I willing to bear the grunt work to, to do it? Because sometimes you have to take on things that you don't like to do in the beginning um, to get where you want to get to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, good watch out for those other duties as assigned, right? Everything that can be <laughs> bundled into there. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, great. Um, any questions um, from the, the group? Anything that you guys have a, a burning need to ask or uh, take advantage of these great mentors that we have time with? Um, while we wait for some questions, I, I have one more to throw out to, um, to you. We'll start with you, Tally. What would you want to know if you were in the position of these students um, that you have learned now? Sorry, uh, read that question. What would you, if you were in the position of the students now, knowing yeah. what you have learned over the course of your career, what would you want to have? What would you want to share with them? I guess would be the best way to say it. What would I want to share with them from my perspective? Your perspective, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I would just say, um, 
it is a long road ahead, I guess. Um, so, you know, prepare yourself. Um, think about, you know, where you want to go, uh, but break it down into the milestones that you need to achieve to, to get there. Um, and it could be ever evolving. So know that it's important to be dynamic. It's important to know yourself, you know, having that self-awareness is, is hugely important um, because that's going to help you land a, a career where you're, you know, you work a third of your day. So you better, you better like the company and, and the job that you're taking on. So, you know, walking away from this, I, I would ask that you really just be introspective and think about the factors that, you know, motivate you and how you can leverage, you know, your mentors, your network. Um, you, you know, asking the right questions to make sure that you find the best fit for you to get you to where you want to be long term as you know it now. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, uh huh. that's good. Yep, yep. Um, and then Gabby will ask you the same question. Um, we do have one that's come up to to teach HR. Did you need a terminal degree in HR? Um, yeah. um, so it, I, I do not have one. Um, so no, if you are a lecturer. Um, so technically, um, yeah, technically lectures don't, it depends on the institution really, um, but there are, um, there's accrediting bodies. And so I had to meet because I don't have a terminal degree. You had to have 10 years plus of progressive experience in human resources and then a graduate degree from an accrediting body. Um, so the IU has AACSB, which is a the business school accreditation, a really good accreditation. And so our requirements were a little bit more stringent for that, but yeah, so 10 years of experience and, it, and I have an MBA. Um, other individuals in um, other universities that are lecturers don't necessarily have those same requirements. So there's lecture and then there's professor. If you're a tenure track professor, then you need a terminal degree. And human resources really, um, probably industrial organizational psychology is the closest program to human resources. There's not too many like full-time accredited PhD programs in HR. So it's more along the lines of a branch of psychology to teach HR as a tenure track professor. Um, so it just depends, but good question. Okay, great. Okay, um, we just have a couple minutes left. I just wanna be respectful of um, everybody's time. Um, a reminder for the students, we still have um, another mentor that's gonna be jumping on to, to do part two of branding. Um, Gabby, is there anything else that you would like to share um, based on the experience that you've gained over the years? Any parting words that you would like to share with the students? Yeah, yeah. Well, first, I'm just so excited for you. And I think um, having this interest so early like you do really puts you ahead. Um, I think that's wonderful. I had no idea that I would be working in HR. I wanted to um, at at it, uh, you know at your stage in life, at the season of life for you. And so super excited. So I think that's one. Number two, just continue to have a growth mindset. Like I really encourage you to, um, and Tally's mentioned this a couple of times, but try to understand and work with mentors to differentiate yourself as a budding HR professional. And so ways you can do that are just constantly be teaching yourself, like going to the SHRM website, devote yourself to one or two articles a week, or maybe, um, you know, familiarize yourself and become a fan of companies that have really progressive, awesome HR departments. And so I don't know if you guys can see this. I try to up my mug game when I'm working from home. Um, Zappos has an amazing HR, like, going on. So, you know, I always tune into Zappos and with their CEO, Tony um, Che, you know, what he's doing, watch his TED Talks. Um, you know, another one is Buffer, if you're familiar with Buffer. Southwest Airlines has great HR. So Disney World has some interesting HR practices that are really progressive. So maybe become a fan of a company or two and learn about HR that way, because then they'll learn through stories, which is a lot easier than textbook. And then another thing is HR, is not leadership, but leadership and management topics are very intertwined. And if you continue to sharpen those muscles, like becoming a better leader, consuming as much information, so start reading, you know, Brene Brown books or Simon Sinek, you know, Adam Grant is a great guy. Um, he's a Harvard professor, actually. So, you know, familiarize yourself with one or two TED Talk authors 
or just authors, uh, thought leaders, we'll call them, that you can follow. I think that would be great. And then work on understanding the business as a whole. So I think, mm -hmm. point Talia, you know, there's a guy we just hired as a CFO, and I really want him to be my mentor because he can help me from the operation. Mm -hmm standpoint and the strategy execution standpoint and understanding finances more because knowing that I like smaller firms, um, you know, and knowing that I might want to be an executive, that's kind of like a goal that I'm setting for myself is becoming smarter on the strategy, on the finance, on the execution side. That'll best prepare me for my role as a chief HR officer, a chief people officer, or perhaps, you know, um, something like a chief of staff role or something like that. So, um, you know, branching out and trying to understand all areas of the business, but really working on that HR brain uh, would be uh, two, two areas. Great. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I also just wanted to let the group know, um, both Tally and Gabby have some other articles that they would recommend. Um, so we're gonna send that out with the reminder of the recording of today's session, just so you guys have access to that. And hopefully the articles will be some supplemental um, reading for you when you get together with your group to continue the debrief and the discussion um, from today's session. So um, with that, I will, it, okay. both Taylor and Gabby, you guys are more than welcome to stay on. We're just going to switch over to the other topic, okay? Thank you so much. I wanted to say, I do have to hop off, but um, if anyone wants to connect with me on LinkedIn, because I see there are some more questions or whatever, and I'm sure Tally has the same offer, please do so. And my email address is, is on LinkedIn as well. So yeah, okay, thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Bye. Have a Bye -bye. great day. Bye. Bye. You too. Nice to meet you. Tell nice to meet you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> okay. And then we have Garrison Gibbons we want to introduce. Hi, Garrison. Hi, everyone. How are you? <laughs> we have everybody on mute right now, and we're, um, we're taking questions in the chat, too. Um, and actually, we were just wrapping up. So the, the first part of the session today was how to land a great HR career. So um, if you don't mind, because we know that you're going to share with us some insights on personal branding, but if you could also share, you know, any thoughts from that perspective, that would be great. And some of the questions that came in last minute, um, I think we can maybe try to address in this session too, if you're yeah, open, because awesome. there's a couple that might relate to personal branding. So, um, and, and also just wanted to let you know, Garrison, we have um, great participation from around the, the globe here. So we have some people with some odd time frames um, that are joining us so if you see a, a couple drop off don't be offended um, we are gonna we are recording the session so everybody will have a chance to um, to review it later on but um, really glad for the students that have stayed on so that we can take advantage of this time with you absolutely I'm excited to be here um, yeah so I guess I can kick off with kind of um, the tail end I heard the tail end of that conversation so um, I have been working in HR now for about five years. Um, I, prior to that, was uh, a theater person. So I worked in the theater industry. Um, I worked for nonprofits doing, <clears throat> nonprofit theater companies or, and then off-Broadway theater companies doing operations. So basically in the theater world, there's not many uh, heads. So I mostly did like everything business related. So that's anything from um, invoices to finance to office management, uh, to onboarding if and when we did, to ramping up the new shows, to even some marketing. Um, and then I really um, started moving into some more of the marketing funnel naturally just because I was the youngest person in the theater company and the theater world was changing to be more online. So anything from e-ticketing to um, moving programs and newsletters to virtual um, to email, all of that was just happening um, when I was working in the industry. So I really adapted a lot of that and um, really started to just wearing many hats. While I was working in the theater industry, I worked part time um, to make some money because there's not a lot of money in theater. Um, and so I worked part time um, at a fitness studio for part of it. And then I started working more specifically in operations there as well. So I was opening new locations, I was hiring, onboarding, managing. Um, so I really just started taking on kind of any opportunity that was given to me um, and fell in love with that industry. And that's when I really started moving into HR more specifically. So I kind of was doing the work before I realized I was doing it um, by hiring and onboarding, training, developing processes, opening new locations, 
Um, and so the fitness world that I worked in was very much like a retail concept. And the fact that it was um, like we had a corporate head and then we also like managed part-time employees. So I dealt with anything from sexual harassment to theft um, in from the locker rooms to kind of you name it. Um, I kind of dealt with it and I was dealing with it for the first time. So it was an interesting experience because I was able to learn on the job and give kind of the flexibility of not needing to be like we weren't the most compliant, we weren't like, you know, we were just kind of all doing it together. And so because of that, I was able to learn a lot on the job, which was really fortunate. Um, eventually, I went and opened a new fitness concept. I was hire number five. And so I built everything from scratch. So I see the question around um, being the sole person. So I totally identify with that. Um, it's definitely difficult to be a one person, uh, like resource. Um, and often in HR, especially in startup world, you probably are going to be. Um, so I would definitely say lean heavily on um, friends and or befriend people that are in the industry, um, add people on LinkedIn, and we'll talk more about the personal brand in a second. But I think being able to admit what you don't know and being open about that, I think it's really important, um, particularly because I think um, there's a lot we don't know. And then when you're learning, you're learning for a reason. And if you are a one person, um, resource. I think it's important to also like learn. It's something that took me a while to learn, but like you pro you were hired for a reason and they obviously don't know what you're doing either. So I think it's important to just acknowledge what you don't know and learn wh what you can through resources online. Um, we're fortunate now that there's a thousand Slack communities. There's a thousand online resources that didn't exist a while ago. So I think that that is something that took a while to learn, but I definitely learned on the job. And I think um, that's how a lot of people are learning today. So I highly recommend asking questions when you don't know the answer. Uh, if you use HR tech stacks, like lean on them, um, ask them questions. Um, they hire a lot of HR people that I was able to learn from when we partnered with like Zenefits, when I partnered with my PEO. I was able to ask a lot of questions and get a lot of answers around like immigration with my immigration lawyer. So I was just like, I was always open about what I didn't know. Um, and what I had experience in, but what I didn't, like, oh, I've done an H-1B, but I haven't done an O-1, so I have no idea how to do that. Um, and you'll be amazed at how much people will help you and walk you through it, um, just from admitting the fact that you don't know the answer. Yeah. Um, so then from there, I moved to corporate, because I wanted more corporate HR experience and just more compliance and less retail. Um, and so I wanted to kind of move away from the operational aspect and move more into HR so that I could learn more of the compliance and more around payroll benefits, administration, um, and scaling those processes. So um, I went in corporate and worked in media, and now I work as the head of HR at a tech company. Um, and it's really exciting. I have a team of two people. Um, so I have a recruiter under me, and then I also manage our EA, who kind of acts as the chief of staff. Um, so um, yeah, we've been really like focused on hiring, and now in this new climate, we're now shifting that focus to now being more of like, what my skill set really is, which is like scaling up HR practices and um, processes and um, cleaning up our like employee handbook and all those fun, exciting things that I now have time to do. Um, so yeah, so that's a little bit about me and like my trajectory. So if any of you are coming from a non-traditional background, I really think HR lends itself to you and is a good opportunity if you, you um, have a lot of interest. I grew up a dancer. Um, I really thought that was going to be my career. It wasn't. Um, and then I started looking for my footing and I think like what ultimately led me or what I, what I liked about dance was kind of telling a story and, and understanding humanity. And so then I started learning about theater and the thing I loved about theater was kind of the, um, empathy that was coming through, um, a theater, the history that goes through theater, kind of understanding human nature and why people do the things that they do and why people did the things that they did. Um, and ultimately like that's what HR is it's interacting with human beings and being a truly empathetic person and so my uh, Understanding your skill set and how to sell your story is something that takes a while to learn But once you're able to do it, I think like that's what makes Leaders that grew from zero to what they are um, That's what sets them apart is like really being able to articulate the story not that they have the best story But that they didn't know how to tell it mm -hmm. Great so Garrison, one thing I just wanted to address one of the questions, because um, I, I think that you've given some great examples um, addressing the question, but we have a, a question from Craig that says, would you recommend a rotational development program for a fast track into HR management? Um, I, I know just echoing some of the comments that we heard from the prior mentors, um, 
don't worry about or don't feel like you have to specialize immediately like be the generalist you know learn different areas i know personally in my career um i had a great boss at the time who had me rotate into different parts of hr so it wasn't part of a formal rotation but that's where i was able to get a sense of what are the different parts and what do i like or what i don't like um in your introduction garrison you gave them some great examples of how you've learned more of hr ops how you've moved into different different um yeah. you know facets of hr um, anything else that you would reinforce, recommend, or add about rotational programs, especially getting into fast tracking into HR management, where obviously you are not? Yeah, um, I definitely would say don't specialize too early. Um, I've actually worked with a lot of recruiters that did that um, and in my career and seen them go on to other jobs. And um, I think recruiting specifically, at least in my experience, slash the people that I've worked with, is one of those jobs that once you're in it, it's hard to get out of it. Um, so like once you specialize in talent, it's hard to be seen as like a generalist because talent is such a very specific thing. It's forward facing, it's company led, it's like all these different things tied into one. Um, so oftentimes like either an organization completely splits the two and talent's its own thing and HR's its own thing, or it's all under one umbrella. But I would say like definitely specializing too early. I've seen my friends in the industry slash people I work with struggle with then wanting to be more of a generalist or take on more because People that hire recruiters, typically what I hear more than anything when my CEO is telling me to hire a recruiter is like, I want a recruiter who only does recruiting. They don't want like someone to wear many hats because I'm already wearing many hats or someone else is already doing that. So I think that definitely learn as much as you want. And if you do want to go into recruiting, go into recruiting, obviously. But I think definitely take your time trying out different avenues. Learn what it, I mean, I, I think even to be a good recruiter, you need to understand what it's like to onboard if like onboarding isn't a part of your like talent acquisition job, uh, what it's like to process payroll because at some point, um, because we're a revenue costly <laughs> function and not a revenue generating function necessarily, um, you might be asked to do those things. Um, you know, someone on your team might get cut or someone on your team might leave. Um, and so like having that skill set is always important because the more hats we can wear and the more that we can tie ourselves to revenue or tie ourselves to productivity, uh, the better. And so at my current job, like I'm a generalist because like though I am a head of HR and I would love to specialize and not have to worry about recruiting at all because that's not really 100% my passion. Um, I'm a generalist because I know that it's very important for me to attach myself to ROI and uh, return of investment and make sure that I'm like that my cost is being productive and making a visible impact. So I handle some finance stuff with my head of finance that I normally wouldn't handle. Um, you know, I will step in and do something on the board deck that typically I wouldn't do. Um, so there's a lot of things that I have had the opportunity to do as well that I wouldn't necessarily, I've reviewed contracts before um, at my current job. So I definitely think learning everything you can will make you the most beneficial because you'll be surprised if you, once you start searching or if you're already searching for jobs, how much people try to loop into HR. <laughs> Sometimes you'll look at a job and it'll be like, you know, that IT, like you're doing IT and you're like, okay, well, that's not, I don't know how to do that. Um, so definitely learn as many skill sets as you can because definitely every HR team is different. Some report into finance, some report into marketing, some report into the CEO, some report into the co-founder who does, who has a fake job title. Um, you know, you will report into whatever function makes sense in that organization. And because of that, that's how you'll be seen in that organization is based on that reporting structure probably. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so let's let's move into your thoughts about um, personal branding. And if you can, um, there's a question here that that may lead into a little bit of personal branding. How would you recommend, um, given the internships are competitive and there's, you know, everybody's looking for different types of work and stuff right now. Um, how do you advise somebody when competing for an intern spot? So um, any yeah. advice you've seen from some of the recruiting that you do um, and get exposed to, but then also how does that lead into your personal brand? Yeah, I mean, I think internships are still that thing in the industry that I would like to see change and become better. I think a lot of times, unfortunately, because there's so many applicants, people get, end up going with someone from their own school or you know, they reach out to their, their, their school or someone reaches out to them on LinkedIn and writes a really good letter. Um, so most of the interns that we've hired at my company, which is a very small company, we're about 50 people, so we're definitely a startup, um, have been people either that 
you know, went to school where the manager went to school or where someone on their team went to school and they know them, um, is a family member, um, wrote a really, really good message on LinkedIn or email, like cold email that was really, really impressive about why specifically they'd want to work at our company. Um, we have had a few applicants, like especially for tech focused jobs, but I would say for all like other operational jobs, it's been that metric. Um, I definitely have seen different circumstances elsewhere, but I think the tough thing about internships ultimately are, as you probably know, like you either have had an internship before or you have it and you're studying something either relevant or you're not. Um, so there's not a lot to go off of, of relevant experience or exposure and past things and things of that nature. So I think that can be a challenge. A lot of times what I've seen successful and what I see advice on in my network when I see people talking about internships is reaching out to companies that you really would like to work for and offering or like and kind of being like, I would love to be an intern at your company um, that necessarily haven't posted for it. Like if I, and this is an open invite to you guys, um, if I knew of an amazing intern that would like really want to work at Notch because they think of what we're doing is really exciting and they like write me a really good letter and we like have a really good conversation and I can sense that they're hungry for it, I would likely hire an intern. I don't necessarily think I need one, so I'm not going out and looking for one, um, but I would love to have an intern that would really want to work for me potentially. So I think that's something that is oftentimes, particularly in HR, um, that can be challenging about an internship is that it's not high on the totem pole because I wouldn't want someone that would just be like, recruiting coordinating because they're not learning anything doing just scheduling people so I'd want to make sure that I could like really package something nicely so my encouragement would be to stand out either make sure that you're reaching out to people on LinkedIn after applying um, and writing something very thoughtful or emailing them if you have their email um, and writing something thoughtful reach out to companies that don't even have internships posted because some companies don't like only look internally because they don't want the massive application overload or they can't handle that um, like the recruiter's too busy and they can't handle hiring interns, which is something we've dealt with before in the past. Um, that would be some of my advice around internships. Okay, great. And I know that you're very passionate about personal branding. So what are some of the key messages that you would like to share with the group about that? Yeah. So personal branding is challenging. So I'll start by saying that it doesn't come naturally for most. Um, and it seems a little scary, trepidatious. I definitely have not done a great job of it throughout my entire career. Um, I definitely think I'm doing a better job now. Um, but I would start personal branding by definitely like, I like to think of it as how I behaved in the interview processes that I've been on in my life. So oftentimes you're always gonna be asked very similar questions as when you're interviewing around like, what's your story? Tell us about your experience. What are some weaknesses? What are some strengths? And so like really working on what your personal brand and story and messages about why you want to do what you do, what you've done previously, what you want to learn, and maybe like what are some weaknesses that you've acknowledged that you've overcome and how you've done it. Packaging that up into like a five minute spiel that you can just open the interview process with. Um, I think it's a very important element of your personal brand and something that like as you strengthen your personal brand, you end up being able to tell that story better. Um, so like um, the more and more interviews I've done and the more I've strengthened like who I am and why I do what I do and understanding like, oh, I really like that. And I don't, I really don't like that. Being able to like understand those things over time can package that up into a very nice package that you can then share um, as the part of your like personal story. So kind of like the spiel I told earlier about why I did what I did and how I moved from job to job. That's something that like I've worked on as I've kind of understood my own story and spent time reflecting on why I did what I did and why I moved where I moved. Um, and so I think that's something that's very, very important and something that's often lacking in the interview processes of people that end up not getting the job. It's like when you can't tell why you moved from one job to another without like talking bad about your boss or blaming other people. And when, when the story doesn't make sense and isn't cohesive um, is when, you know, that often adds a lot more questions than there does answers. So I think like one of your goals in telling your story from a interview process or like early on uh, upon meeting people is definitely like making sure that you're giving more answers than you are like opening yourself up to questions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's something that I would advise a lot of interview candidates about, but particularly in HR, because the weird thing is oftentimes you're being interviewed by people that are outside of your department, um, especially as you get 
more senior or if you are the sole person um, that's going to be offered at a job, they've either never had your function before or they have. And so my recommendation would be just understanding that like you're going to have to open yourself up to probably some of the worst interview questions you've ever had, all the ones you can predict, like what's your biggest weakness or um, you know, if you, who are the three people you most admire, like a bunch of cheesy things you're probably going to be asked. But then also on top of that, you're going to have to really sell your story and why HR is relevant without being too much on a soapbox. Um, in terms of like personal brand on LinkedIn and, or like Mm -hmm. speaking on panels or doing things like what I'm doing right now, that's something that I definitely didn't do until about a year plus ago. Um, I was a, public speaker in high school. I was speech and debate champion. I was top 10 in the nation. So I knew I had, like had public speaking ability. I obviously also did dance and theater. So I'm not necessarily shy or timid. I'm very much an extrovert. But when I went to happy hours and um, networking events, I would have the most social anxiety I've ever had and feel totally out of place. And imposter syndrome definitely kicked in, um, especially in a market like where I am in New York like it's a very competitive market almost all of the New York experience even outside of HR or business is about like what you did on the weekend how cool you are what you do who you know um and so it can be a very intimidating place but I think um finally identifying that everyone's in that boat and just like going up like literally if you're at a happy hour or you're at a social event for networking everyone's feeling as awkward and uncomfortable as you are and everyone's wanting either to go up to someone and talk to them just to strike conversation or to have someone do that to them. So I think acknowledging that is something that took time for me. And then second was just like, I kind of forced myself to just do it, like force myself to post on LinkedIn more, force myself to go to a networking event that I didn't really 100% know if I wanted to go to. So like that when the social anxiety or imposter syndrome would kick in, I just, just would force myself to try it. And once I tried it, or once I did it, I felt more comfortable. So I think that's something that it takes time to just kind of do. And then like realize what you have a say about and what you don't, or like what you feel inclined to talk about and not. So like when I post on LinkedIn, I talk about very, very personal things because I think it's important to speak truthfully. And I've always, I think one of the things I was always scared of about personal brand is that it seemed inauthentic in the sense of like, oh, I'm having to put myself out there. I'm having to sell this story about how amazing I am as an HR person. And instead I was like, well, why don't I start by sharing what I like and how I'm feeling? And if I'm feeling anxiety, talking about that openly, talk about what it's like to be a gay man, Um, talk about what it's like to deal with uh, inclusion issues at previous companies. So I started talking about things that like I cared about or what felt real to me. And I think that made it feel less like a personal brand and more like me telling my story or like me talking about something that I feel relevant. So I started using it as a social media platform like I would on Instagram or like with my personal friends, but in a professional sense about professional things that I cared about. And I noticed that the response was high. Like people really liked it and thought, oh, wow, I like what you have to say. Or people would slack me on the side or like message me on the side and say like, I really enjoy how honest you're being. It's really refreshing. And so I noticed that my personal brand was really like not necessarily as much about putting on something or, you know, being something and more around doing what I like to do and talk about things that matter to me and that are relevant. And if I don't have something relevant to say, I just don't say it, which is something that took me a very talkative person a long time to learn. Great. Great. I think great points and great advice, especially um, if, you know, people are still kind of forming who they are, right. And figuring out um, if you're, if they're wanting to deal with an HR space, for example, and you're still building your HR experience, um, I think some of the key tips and stuff that you talked about, Garrison, are great. You know, just knowing yourself, you know, communicate things that you believe in, get your spiel down, right? Yeah. And it'll learn. I mean, it'll change. Like, obviously, you guys are young. I'm, I'm young. I, my personal story has changed a lot. And I think, like, giving yourself permission to do that, too. Like, knowing that, like, if you if you go into an ops role and you're like an office manager and then you move and do something else, like it all changes and and ebbs and flows over time. Like your JD in 15 years isn't going to include that job probably. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, you know, like there will be changes and ebbs and flows. Like I, my personal brand will change and evolve over time. I've seen 
Um, at my current job, um, you know, someone's a new, uh, new mother. She just had a child about eight months ago. Her personal brand has changed completely. Every way that she looks at life, the way that she approaches conversation, the way she behaves at work. Like you see a visible change because she has something completely different, like other priorities in life. So like she used to be someone who was very stressed out. Her anxiety was constantly high. Now she's much more calm because I'm sure her life at home is a little more hectic. So, um, you know, people change as their life experiences change and things of that nature. So I think give yourself permission and do what feels right in the moment um, and what feels right now versus what you think might feel right in three years. Okay, perfect. Um, any last minute questions? We're almost to the, at the end of our time here. Um, anything else, any burning questions anybody has for Garrison? Okay. Um, awesome. Thank you so much, Garrison. You shared a lot of great insights. Um, and, and everybody, we have this recorded, so feel free to, to um, view it again and go back to, to some of the key lessons learned and some of the great tips. Um, just a reminder to everybody, we have another session next Tuesday. Um, we're going to be talking about people analytics. So we have a couple more mentors that will be joining us for that. So thank you for hanging in there today. Um, thanks so much, Garrison, for being yeah, able to join us and, and sharing. Add me on LinkedIn, of course, if you want. Um, I'm sure they can share it out or I can share it. Um, I would love to keep in touch. Thanks, guys. Okay, Stay safe great. and healthy. Thank you. Have a good day.